tonight on Lifetime. You're about to come face to face with some extraordinary women. Some are living, perhaps in your own community, married with children and careers of their own. And some are dead. What they all share is a spiritual belief, a way of life, and a legitimate fear of society's misunderstanding. You'll meet a woman called Valperga, living on the edge of town in medieval Germany, who is about to hear a fateful knock on her door and Martha Corey in Salem, Massachusetts, 300 years ago. She was worried that her husband might get her into trouble at the witch trials and tried to prevent him from going by hiding his saddle under the bed. And women today, a lawyer, a writer, a community leader. In meeting them, you will discover the true meaning of the word witch and what it means to practice their timeless craft. All here, Tonight on Lifetime, in Witches, an Intimate Portrait. Martha Corey is an older woman who lives on the outskirts of town with her second husband. It is the 17th century in Salem, Massachusetts, almost 100 years before the American Revolution. Martha, whose first husband had died when she was still living back in England, is a woman who speaks her mind, a woman of strong opinions. She must have enjoyed the religious and other freedoms promised to everyone who came to the New World. Her husband, Giles, is outspoken too, sometimes about his strong-willed and opinionated Martha, which makes for an uneasy marriage between them. Little did Martha know that the fear and prejudice she thought she'd left behind in Europe would find her among these picturesque hills and valleys. It was an ancient fear, perhaps the fear of the unknown, that would find her here in Salem when they came to accuse her of being a witch. Martha Corey was a woman who was in her mid-60s, 65, I think, who'd recently remarried. She was born in England, but lived in Salem town and then moved out near Salem Village where the outbreak began. She'd been a widow. She'd been married once before. I suspect that Giles Corey, like other husbands of accused witches might have believed she was a witch. 1692 was a tough winter for Salem. There had just been 20 long years of fighting with the local natives, and the government wants more taxes. Martha Corey, in her second marriage, is living quietly on the edge of town. With times like these, trouble could come from anywhere. A jealous neighbor, a business rival, even your own husband. The troubles begin in the home of the newly appointed minister, Reverend Samuel Paris. In addition to the minister and his wife, 
The household includes their nine-year-old daughter, Betty, their niece, 12-year-old Abigail Williams, and a slave named Tituba that Paris had brought back from Barbados. The two young girls spend much time alone with Tituba, who tells them fascinating folk stories from her native island. To add a touch of color to their otherwise drab lives, the girls begin to experiment with crystal balls and fortune telling, with chanting and dancing. The girls enjoy their journey into the world of the supernatural, but the weekly sermons delivered from Reverend Paris's pulpit convinces them that they are committing a great sin by participating in her pagan rituals. Mysteriously, the girls begin to have a series of bizarre fits. They shout out curses and blasphemies. To the God-fearing people of the town, the message is clear. This is devil's work. The girls have been bewitched. Remember, these were young women who were tempted to become witches themselves. A possessed person was not a witch, but a person who was uh, being attacked by the devil in order to force that young person to become a witch. A possessed person was someone who was simply being tempted to become a witch, whether she did or not, uh, was another story. We may never know whether the girls were actually hysterical or just acting that way. No records exist of the court questioning their conduct. But news of their affliction spreads and more young girls become affected. Eventually, 25 girls say they are bewitched. Soon they claim to have visions, visions in which they see the witches responsible for setting evil spirits upon them. Three women are pointed out. The first is a penniless local beggar. The second is a wealthy town resident who, rumor has it, committed the unpardonable sin of having sex prior to marriage. And the last is none other than Tituba, the slave in Reverend Paris's household. Martha Corey watches the goings-on disapprovingly and skeptically. She's not only outspoken and opinionated, but deeply religious. She wants no part of the hysteria. She's also worried that her outspoken husband, Giles, might get her into trouble. When he attempts to go into town to watch the proceedings, she tries to keep him at home by hiding his saddle under the bed. On March the 1st, 1692, the pre-trial of the three women begins in the Salem Village Meeting House. When the first of the accused is brought into court, the young girls immediately fall into fits, claiming that evil spirits are moving around the room. When Tituba, the Reverend Paris's servant, is brought into court, she confesses right away and drags the two other accused witches down with her. They are thrown in jail, where the oldest woman dies awaiting trial. The problem is, the girls of Salem continue to have fits. And when local ministers press them to name any remaining witches, one of the girls calls out the name of none other than Martha Corey. The trial begins. All the accused claim to be innocent. They are jailed anyway. But the girls of the village still claim they are being harassed by evil spirits. Someone will have to pay for the witchcraft that is strangling the area. Someone like Martha Corey. She is taken into court. During questioning, she accuses the court of hypocrisy. And then, she asks to pray for divine help. It is a sure sign of the witch, because it is blasphemy for a woman to pray in public. Martha was a Christian. She was, as she said in her court testimony, a gospel woman. She was also not 
unwilling to speak out when things bothered her. So that when, you know, people came and she heard rumors that she was suspected of witchcraft, uh, she spoke out very strongly that she was not a witch, she was a Christian woman. Every gesture Martha makes in court is mimicked by the girls. If she so much as raises her hand, they copy her, a sign she has possessed them. The motives and reactions of the girls are never questioned by the court. The assumption is guilt. It is a losing battle for Martha. And it doesn't help that her husband is among the accusers. He even claims that Martha has cast a witch's spell on their own farm animals. She is finally thrown into prison to await her fate on the gallows. Ultimately, nearly 200 people are accused of witchcraft, three quarters of them women. Neighbor has turned against neighbor, husband against wife, and children against parents. Forced to pay for their own jail fees, many of the accused are left impoverished. Ironically, even Martha's husband, Giles, does not escape the witch trials. He, too, is accused of being a witch and is eventually crushed to death under heavy stones. It is a fate so painful that before he dies, he will plead for more weight to be put on him so that he might die more quickly. Nineteen of the accused witches are hanged on Gallows Hill. Fourteen of them are women. One of the last to die on a September day is Martha Corey. Until the very end, she claims she is not a witch. By the end of 1692, the people of Salem seem to have finally had enough of the violence and death, enough of the witch trials. Not much is known about the fate of the two girls who were originally possessed. Betty Paris, the Reverend's daughter, was sent out of Salem by her family. She came back a year later, a healthy girl. Her cousin Abigail moved away the day after she named the last witch. I cast this circle. Today, the horror that once descended upon Martha and so many others is not forgotten. It's as if the ghosts of the long ago dead linger to tell us their stories. We honor those died for our freedom. Martha Corey. Rebecca Nurse. Mary Estes. Sarah Good. Bridget Bishop. The name of Salem still has the power to summon the sound of accusing voices in a log courtroom and the heavy weight of a body swaying at the end of a rope. Approximately a hundred years before Martha Corey finished her life at the end of a rope in Salem, a woman named Valperga lived in Germany in a sleepy little village called Dillingen. Like Martha, she too lives alone on the outskirts of town. Valperga is an elderly widow who supports herself as a midwife and healer. She has seen dozens of babies brought into the world and has coaxed just as many women through dangerous and painful births. Unfortunately for Valperga, she lives during the infamous burning time, a time when people accused of witchcraft are burned alive at the stake. Her quiet life is about to be shattered as witch hunt fever finally arrives in Dillingen. Ten years earlier, the baby of one of Valperga's patients died while being born. Now that death has come back to haunt her, since the townsfolk of Dillingen suspect her of having had a hand in the child's death, of being a witch. Or perhaps they just want her property. Greed was an all too common incentive when it came to accusing someone of being a witch. Whatever the motive, Valperga would have been alone that night, minding her own business in the comfort of her home, 
when the great witch hunt finally came to her door. Imagine yourself as a woman living alone somewhere in a cottage. Um, maybe you have a cat as a pet. Um, your household accoutrements are around you, a, a broom to sweep the ashes with, a knife to cut your vegetables with. And you've lived this way for so long, but the fear is there, out there, somewhere in the darkness is the witch finder. Somewhere out in the darkness is somebody who does not like you. And then the knock comes to the door in the middle of the night. You hear the sound of villagers. Somebody has pointed the finger at you, and you know that you are going to face the witch finder. Valperga wouldn't be remembered today if the townspeople hadn't come to get her that night. In fact, Valperga isn't even her name. No one knows what her first name was. What Valperga really means in German is witch. The witch. She has been immortalized in a thousand myths and fairy tales. A terrifying entity, cunning and evil. The specter of night, the caster of spells, the tormentor of souls. It is said she indulged in all night orgies while eating human flesh and drinking human blood. Witches were even said to have sex with the devil who gave witches a broom with which to fly through the night to their forbidden sexual encounters. Perhaps this picture of the witch on a broom was related to the ancient fertility ritual for crops, during which a woman would run through her fields on a fertility pole. The propaganda was that the word witch meant something evil. It was not good to be a witch because it meant you ate babies and, and drank blood and, and worshipped a, a devil, which we had never thought of. Through the centuries, there have been so many misconceptions about witches. Uh, the green-faced warded hag that wears the conical hat, the night flyer, the sorceress or sorcerer who works as the devil's consort. There are many negative connotations and myths about witches, but I will assure you that all are very untrue. What is true is that the term witch comes from an ancient word, Wicca, which was an ancient folk religion. There are debates as to what the word means. Some people say it means the craft of the wise, others that it means to bend, to twist. The original meaning, the Anglo-Saxon meaning of it, is to twist, to bend, like, like twisting straw. Believed by some to imply an ability to tap into and shape the unseen forces of nature, Wicca, or witchcraft, has long been confused with Satanism. Satanism opposes the conventional view of the divine and worships the devil, whereas witchcraft follows a spiritual path in no way connected with evil, malice, or harm. In fact, the long-held credo of the witch is, do what you will, harm none. But harm was certainly on the minds of the torch-bearing villagers who were marching down a street in Dillingen in 1587. They were looking for Valperga, the elderly midwife who lived all alone on the outskirts of town. Then they stopped in front of her door and knocked. The first thing they did was to drag her away to look for the mark of the witch. You are going to be publicly humiliated, probably stripped naked while they search for a witch mark with their witch prickers. You have flea bites because you're not very clean, and one of those flea bites might just be the devil's mark. That's what you're going to be told. And you know about these witch prickers. They're terrible long needles that they stick into you. What you don't know is they're a trick. They have a retractable blade. And the witch finder says, look, she feels no pain and draws no blood. She is a witch. That's the fear you would have lived with in the Middle Ages. Um, that is the fear that would have kept your heart beating when you heard the knock on the door at night. The hysteria and greed 
of the burning time is reflected in the allegations flung at Valproga. She is accused of murdering more than 40 babies, two mothers, and of using witchcraft to kill a horse, some geese, and a number of pigs. The villagers even blame her for causing three adults to die in a hailstorm that she conjured up by an evil spell. Under torture, Valperga breaks down and admits to anything her accusers want her to say. Under torture, people admitted to wrongdoing. They admitted to participating in these forbidden rites with Satan and using the power that the devil had given them to cause harm to their neighbors. Why did they do this? Well, they realized at a certain point that the pain was unbearable, that they couldn't withstand it any longer. Another explanation, which makes excellent sense given the psychology of the time, is that having experienced the pain of the torture, they concluded, in fact, in their own minds, that they were really guilty. And there are many cases on record in which people willingly went to the torture, convinced that it would exonerate them. And when they discovered, on the contrary, that they were feeling excruciating pain and felt compelled to confess, many times we know from their later accounts that they confessed because they were convinced that, in fact, they were guilty. During the burning times, when they poured in all this poor ignorant peasants who were just doing nature worship. And they tortured them for days and they said, oh, did you go out and have sex with the devil? Poor little peasant girl, after 24 hours being pulled apart and pierced her body, she would say, sure, yes. I would say anything if I'm tortured, wouldn't you? Valperga is stripped naked, utterly humiliated and terrified in front of her neighbors. The mark of the devil is found beneath her left shoulder, and the townspeople of Dillingen condemn her to die, guilty of murder, of preparing evil spells against her neighbors, of indulging in carnal relations with the devil, of flaunting her sexuality before men. Valperga will burn to death, but not before her breasts and arms are mutilated with red-hot irons and her right hand severed. Only then is she tied to the stake and burned alive. Valperga's pathetic cries for mercy are not heard. As she is burned alive at the stake, her dying voice joins untold thousands of other victims of what has come to be called the Woman's Holocaust. In the earliest times, people prayed to the forces of nature, such as the sun and the moon, fire, water, and wind. It was in this time that the Way of the Witch was born. The Earth itself was celebrated as a giver of life, as Mother Earth, a female source of power that was great and nourishing. Many other ancient societies worshipped deities that were essentially female, forces connected to fertility and abundance. They worshipped not a god, but a goddess. Then, as the centuries unfolded, the great Western religions were born, and with them, the concept of a female god disappeared. Some held on to that early nature-based goddess. Perhaps that is what would get them into so much trouble. By the time of the Middle Ages, warfare, militant systems, and to some extent even the great religions had placed men firmly in power. And the function of women in society had changed. 
Women were now in positions of subservience. They were primarily homemakers and the healers of society, the brewers of tonics for the ill and afflicted, and especially the village midwives. Many still practice the ancient rituals that reflected their honor for the ancient mother goddess, their respect for the earth, and their knowledge of holistic medicine. But now, as apparent non-believers in the major Western religions, they were being branded as pagans. They were often feared, and eventually were called witches. The year is 1486. A do-it-yourself manual for identifying witches is published, and then is endorsed by Pope Innocent III. It is called the Malleus Maleficarum, which means the hammer against witches. Using its guidelines, anyone could now identify and accuse a witch. Passages in the text were often brutal and intolerant, especially of women. They are evil, lecherous, vindictive. Seek them out by finding the devil's teeth and claw marks upon her skin, by locating the devil's teeth on which she suckles her demon consorts, by her moles, blemishes, and scars that are the marks of Satan. There were towns in Germany in particular where there were no women left after the Inquisitors came through. Everyone was killed. My family survived the burning times. My family survived everything because we were in the mountains. And when you are a mountain people and you are tucked away in Transylvania, we know everything there and we know every nook and cranny. So when they came for us, they died before they found us. And that's why I can claim a, an 800-year-old family tree. Zsuzsana Budapest lives in San Francisco. She can trace her lineage back to those dark times. Like other witches, Zsuzsana will not allow the memory of the women who were so brutally tortured and killed to fade away. When I walk about here, I remember the witches who were burned and drowned and tortured how they embraced death, how they rushed into the ocean to kill themselves in order to avoid the Inquisition. Their names are nowhere here to be seen, but I know they are together with all these people somewhere in a happy place. It's very important to us to reclaim the word witch because of the people that died during the burning times. If we don't remember that, then that kind of religious persecution can happen again. Today, there are many modern women who proudly call themselves witches. They may no longer be burnt at the stake for doing so, but they still may put themselves and their families at great risk. Martha Corey and Valperga Hausmannin were women with beating hearts and families, with dreams and sadness. But Martha and Valperga also stand as symbols of hundreds of years of brutal persecution through torture, rape, and murder. As accused witches and as women, Martha and Valperga serve as reminders of those days when witches were hunted down, of where intolerance and fear can lead. Perhaps they would have liked to know that many people today are reclaiming the word and the way of the witch. High on a mountain in Southern California, a group gathers to celebrate an ancient ritual marking the arrival of midsummer. Holding to tradition, they are modern day witches. We call you 
members of one of the fastest growing religious movements in America today. More than 200,000 people now follow the pathway known as Wicca, the way of the witch. Barbara Morgan is a successful attorney with a major law firm in Los Angeles and has been a practicing witch since 1991. Wicca is really a religious thing. It's the religion of the witch. It is not some interesting idea or some people who want to go off and do some offbeat thing. The religion of Wicca is re-emerging in various places around the world. Janet Farrar lives in Ireland and has been a witch for more than 20 years. She is now one of the world's most respected writers on the subject of witchcraft. Many people are afraid of it. They're afraid that they will lose their homes, their children, their jobs. Um, I feel that if you are able to state publicly what you are, so much the better, because it is a growing religion and the days of hiding are over. Marie Guerrero, mother and housewife, makes her home in Salem. Within the witchcraft community, she bears the title of High Priestess. I practice witchcraft. I'm a witch in total. And I think when people, I don't necessarily come up to them and flash my pentacle and say, guess what I am. Um, no more than I would expect them to come up to me and flash a cross or a Star of David or any other religious artifact and say, guess what I am. I think they take me seriously because I come across first as a person. Like many modern day witches, Zsuzsana Budapest has made a name for herself writing about her religion. Born in Budapest, she escaped the Hungarian uprising of 1956 and settled in the United States three years later. She's dedicated to preserving the ancient religion that reveres nature. To claim yourself as a witch means that you claim yourself for Mother Nature. You say, my alliance is to Mother Nature and all of her children are my siblings. I have no enemies. In Massachusetts, Lori Cabot, best known as the Witch of Salem, turns to the use of makeup and clothes to proudly proclaim herself a witch. After I learned to be a witch, it was illegal at that time, so you really had to hide it. And I tried to fit in with everyday life, wearing your Gucci skirt, I got married, I had children, and then I got divorced. And I thought, what is the strongest thing about me? Who am I? And the strongest thing about me was my witchcraft. In fact, practicing witchcraft was against the law in certain parts of the United States until 1985, when the Supreme Court overturned local laws. Witchcraft may no longer be illegal, but it is still misunderstood and not accepted. Since becoming a witch, I think the most common misconception I have come across is the fallacy that we have sex orgies um, and that we molest children. We've had terrible battles in Britain over uh, satanic ritual abuse cases and many witches have felt under terrible threat as a result of this. And of course now, after investigation, they've all been squashed flat. It's a dangerous thing to do because there's still so much um, misunderstanding out there. I mean, there's uh, women who have uh, lost their children in custody battles because they're witches. There are people that have been driven out of their homes because they were having a, a coven meeting and the people around them didn't understand. Being a witch mother is probably no different than being a Catholic mother or Baptist mother, but in my case it was quite different because I made a vow to the goddess that I would always wear ritual robes for the rest of my life. So my daughters had a mother running around in robes and capes, and we know that it was quite difficult for them. One day my mother and my sister and I, we were really young, were standing to cross a street, and some man drove by and he looked at my mother and said, I hope you burn in hell. How could someone else 
say something so hard. That's my mother, you know? She's not just like Habit, she's my mom. I had no idea that all those thousands of years of propaganda had worked so well. It was very difficult, but I was not going to go back. I mean, I know my identity. Um, the word witch is a delicious word. I'd never give it up. But how is it that witch is a delicious word, especially when it has been the source of so much misunderstanding and pain? Ritual is fundamental to the religion of the witch. A calendar year is divided into eight equal parts, each one commencing with a major ceremony, or witch's sabbat. Sawan takes place on October the 31st, or Halloween. In no way connected with the popular concept of the holiday, with its traditional collection of ghosts, goblins, and ghouls, this is one of the most important of all the festivals celebrated by the witch. The Samhain ritual that we have is a very important time. It's one of our higher Sabbaths. Samhain is the time when the veil between the worlds is very, very thin, when the spirit world is joined with the world of form, because there are the two worlds that we believe in, and the spirits are the closest. It's also, according to the Celtic calendar, our new year. Because Sawan also celebrates rebirth and the continuity of life, an important part of the ceremony symbolizes the union of male and female. We use the chalice and the athame, and as we insert the athame into the chalice, we say, as the male is to the female. And then we talk about how together they bring blessedness. For the witch, sex is the life force. And why? Because it is this affinity that no one controls. It's out of control. You never know who you fall in love with. Most unlikely people attract each other. It is like a mad woman's hand is making the matchmaking, and it works, and sometimes it works for a while, and then it doesn't. What's her purpose? Why is she torturing us thusly? Well, her purpose is to get babies. That's her number one purpose. The second purpose is to have fun and to have fun and to bind hearts together, to create community. Heaven and hell have no place in the religion of the witch, but there is a belief in different kinds of reincarnation. In the final analysis, though, the Wiccan philosophy is that this life is divine, that our destiny is being played out here and now. The witch's power is the natural power of the universe, and like electricity, it's what you plug into it. You can plug in something useful, like a television camera, or something destructive, like the electric chair. When you become a witch, the first thing you learn about this natural power of the universe, which is all around us and that we use all the time, is that it hurts. You can burn your fingers with it. Therefore, you use it wisely. You use it in a positive sense. If you use it destructively, it comes back on you. It returns to you. And when it does, you suffer the full penalty. This is where we believe that you pay for your sins now, not once you are dead. A witch's perspective is that this is the divine plane. This, where we are right here and now, this is sacred. And it's only our uh, tendency to, to divide, as human beings, our perception of things that makes us see some things as sacred and some things as mundane. The reality is that it is all sacred. This is it. But there is magic in this life, according to the witch. Not a magician's trick, but something real that can be tapped into, that exists both within us and outside as part of nature. Magic is very real. Magic is a very important aspect of everyone's life, and to ignore that magic within you disempowers you. A lot of people misunderstand this whole idea of what magic is. What it really is is a calling on, a harnessing of the forces of nature. You know, as a witch, you might call and say, 
goddess, please come. Come with your powers of air, fire, water, and earth, and be here now in this spell that I'm casting. The magic of the world for my mother was in the winds. We prayed on the winds. We didn't have any occult supplies. She would walk um, into an open window, you know, she would talk to the winds in her backyard. But when she called the winds, they would come, winds would wake. You could feel it on your skin. You would see a little bit the leaves moving, but not overall. It wasn't like wind, a normal wind that comes and shakes everything up. It was just personal wind. And then she would say, they are here. It always gave me goose pimples because they are here. Who are they, mom? You know, and, and it was ancestors. It was the old one. What happened was I was riding in the car with a friend and my friend said to me, have you ever heard anything about the goddess? And I, and I said, no, but I was really struck by this. And so on the next full moon, I wrapped myself in a white sheet in my backyard and the moon was full and I lit a candle and I looked up at the moon and I said, goddess, here I am. And I had this overwhelming feeling of being fully embraced and being accepted by her. After that, my whole entire life changed. High in the hills, not far from the ocean, Barbara Morrigan and her group celebrate the summer solstice, another of the eight witches' sabbaths that mark the passage of the year. In this technological world, where there is so much stress laid upon us, and so great a spiritual need inside mankind to feel that he is part of the earth he lives on, and that he can do something, anything, no matter how small it is, to help preserve it for future generations. When he discovers a religion like witchcraft, he or she turns around and says, yes, I'm at home. I feel that I've come home at long last. After so many centuries of persecution, modern day witches are finally beginning to wear their identity proudly. In doing so, they are upholding an ancient tradition to honor and preserve the natural world and all that is within it. anything worse than being accused of something you didn't do when you'd never be able to prove your innocence. But if the Salem trials were today, could modern drug testing provide the evidence to acquit? This could be associated with LSD. An autopsy on this ancient mummy may help unravel the witch's curse as we uncover Secrets of the Dead. of the Dead was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Almost every civilization in history has believed in witches and their supernatural power to do great harm. Witches were said to have sold their souls to the devil in return for the power to bewitch other mortals. When people fell sick with unexplainable ailments, witchcraft was blamed. And if a person was accused of being a witch, there was little they could do to prove their innocence. 
they usually suffered severe consequences. But now there might finally be an explanation for the mysterious symptoms of bewitchment that have resulted in so many false accusations and deaths. As I was starting to work through this jigsaw of evidence, I felt like a detective. I was on a, on a great sleuthing project, and every time some piece of evidence fell into place, I was so excited. Linda Caporell's investigation may also have unearthed the true culprit behind an ancient murder mystery, a man brutally hacked to death more than 2,000 years ago. Her breakthrough, a link to an hallucinogenic drug made famous in the 1960s. Between the 15th and 17th centuries, witch persecution in Europe reached epidemic proportions. During three dark centuries, more than 40,000 innocent men, women, and children were killed for supposedly bewitching other people. The threat was perceived to be so real, even the Vatican issued warning decrees, and the panic and zeal that followed led to horrific witch hunts all across the continent. In Germany, one hunt resulted in 274 suspected witches being burnt at the stake in a single year. And the danger did not end when the Europeans came to the New World. The settlers brought with them their superstitions and laws. The practice of witchcraft was the work of the devil, a crime punishable by death. The most famous of all the witch trials happened in the early days of this small New England town. Today, Salem is a tourist destination with a penchant for trinkets, but its modeled history is far more dark. The truth is a tragedy made famous by Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible. In 1692, Salem was hit by a mysterious sickness that left many in the town horribly ill. Lacking a better explanation, doctors blamed bewitchment, and the roundup that followed devastated the town. 150 people were imprisoned, and 19 men and women were executed as witches. Until the end, they protested their innocence. In my view, the people who were hanged during the Salem witch trials were heroes because they probably could have saved their lives by confessing. Sarah Good, I think, was 38 years old. She had a baby die in prison. She left her little five-year-old daughter chained in prison and went to the gallows. Every account that exists say they went very bravely. They didn't beg for mercy. They didn't complain. They didn't nothing. They just took their fate. And I think that's extraordinarily brave, extraordinarily brave. I can't imagine such dignity and um, such firmness of faith. Their faith was the reason they were there. Their town was one of the first Puritan settlements in the New World, and the few hundred residents were desperate to eke out an agricultural existence from the land. They wanted to practice a more fundamental form of Christianity than had been allowed in England. Puritan comes from the, the word purify. So they wanted to be m much more simple than the Church of England. They wanted to found, as, as John Winthrop said, a city on the hill that would be admired and would, be, uh, would gain God's approval. In order to do that, they needed to be intensely loyal to his word as it was interpreted by ministers from the Bible. And that meant that their lives were very circumspect and very, um, very difficult, probably. When things went wrong, they turned to the church for guidance. The people spent a lot of time in church. It wasn't just a half hour, it was a long session, morning and afternoon. And this was the key to how they lived. And so anything that seemed to be aberrant 
uh, in that society had to be addressed right away and fixed because they needed to stay on the path that they had set themselves to follow that uh, was going to be, in God's sight, a good path. It was a very intense way to live, I believe, and anything could throw it into a turmoil. They had no knowledge of science as, as would happen in the 18th century. So, for instance, a storm might be interpreted as a sign of God's displeasure or a crop failure, a drought, that sort of thing. So in December 1691, when a number of settlers were struck down by a terrifying illness during a particularly harsh winter, they were convinced that the agents of the devil were responsible. And they had to be ever vigilant against Satan, who was waiting and waiting to um, catch people and take them to his side. The ill suffered from violent convulsions, or fits. They would writhe in agony, screaming in terror. Their skin felt like it was being pricked all over by pins. And they were tormented by haunting visions of wild animals. As the symptoms spread through the town, people began to panic, desperate for answers. Science could not provide any, so the town doctor made the only diagnosis he could think of. He blamed witchcraft. During the year that followed, eight afflicted young girls became the most powerful force in Salem. A court was convened where they testified that they had been bewitched. Convulsing and wailing in the courtroom, they began to accuse countless innocent citizens of being witches. I think there was terrible fear in the communities around Salem that names were going to be mentioned by the girls and action was going to be taken by adults against those people. And you wouldn't want your name mentioned. You wouldn't want to be called in on a complaint and questioned. The questioning was always going to conclude that you were guilty. And so the girls' behavior, because the authorities paid attention to it, created a terrible fear. Fear turned to hysteria as the accusations of the sick girls reached even the most unlikely quarters. Rebecca Nurse, of all the victims, she's the one that seems to epitomize the, the Puritan matriarch, a saintly woman. Everyone loved her. her. Her family was all around her. She was 72, in ill health. I mean, it's a very a sad story to think of a woman like that being accused of something that, in that context, in that time, was an outrageous thing, just outrageous to think you had made a pact with the devil. In the space of nine months, 150 so-called witches had been singled out, arrested, and thrown into prison. Each was presented with an impossible choice, confess to bewitching the girls or face execution. 19 chose to die. It became pretty clear that you were going to be found guilty unless you confessed. And if you confessed, you were committing a crime against God, which would be even worse than dying. I can't imagine anything worse than being conf accused of something you didn't do and knowing you'd never be able to prove your innocence. And 200 years later, modern science may be able to prove that there was a perfectly rational explanation for the symptoms that sparked the execution of so many innocent men and women. <laughs> Professor Linda Caporell is a behavioral psychologist with an interest in the Salem witch trials. When she first began her investigation into Salem, she embraced the accepted belief that there was no physical reason for the illness, that the eight girls were simply malicious and had faked their symptoms. The conventional explanation with Salem was that it was psychological. The girls were uh, 
described by one historian as a pack of bobby soxers on the loose. They were trying to become the center of attention. And um, from this grew a hysteria that spread throughout the community. But for Linda, the testimony defied such a simple explanation. She agreed that the girls may have lied on the stand, but felt that some of their symptoms were too severe to have been made up. Clearly, there is some faking of hallucinations. There is some faking of convulsions. But the original afflictions and the descriptions of the afflictions could not have been faked. People described a black thing comes into the room, and the thing has the body of a monkey and the legs and the claws of a rooster, and has a face that looks something like a man. The convulsions that are described are so horrible. One description has, um, has a girl that is convulsing so badly that her head is almost touching her heels. The, the forms of these convulsions literally wrench the body. Linda examined the prevalence of the illness that had driven the Salem witch trials. She found that the tormenting hallucinations and nightmare visions were far more widespread than she had previously thought. It wasn't just the girls who were experiencing hallucinations. Other people in the community, men as well as women, were hallucinating or reported hallucinations and making accusations. The evidence was there in the trial records. I saw a woman coming towards us, about 16 or 20 pole from us, but did not know who it was. My wife could not see her. When I did get up on my horse again, to my understanding, there stood a cow, where I saw the woman. Linda pondered what could have caused such bizarre hallucinations. When the unexpected answer came, it was a flash of inspiration. One evening I was studying with a friend and I was rereading uh, another historian's account of the Salem events. And there was something in the paragraph that I was reading that just made me think, this, this could be associated with LSD. LSD, more popularly known as acid, is a drug with extraordinary hallucinogenic properties. It attained notoriety in the 60s as the psychedelic potion of the flower power generation that sprung out of the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco. The draw of LSD was that it could cause acid trips. These trips could be heavenly or a living nightmare. As a student, I lived in Haight-Ashbury and uh, knowledge about LSD was very common. People described having hallucinations. They would see plants turning into animals. They would see walls dripping with blood or dripping with different colors. Uh, they reported lights that were uh, wavy in form and undulating. Um, a stomach ache, a strange, uh, strange sensations in their heads. And I was struck by the similarity between some of the things that I was reading and things that I'd heard years before as a student. The symptoms of bewitchment were unsettlingly reminiscent of a bad acid trip. But what connection could there be between the supposedly bewitched residents of Salem and the drug LSD? The answer lay in the strange findings of Swiss neurophysiologist Albert Hoffman. Hoffman had made an extraordinary discovery in 1943 while experimenting with a naturally growing fungus called ergot. Ergot had long been known to contain various potent chemicals, and Hoffman had been trying to harness them for use in medical applications. One day in his lab, he made an extract from the ergot fungus and then accidentally spilled some of it on his hand. The extract must have been absorbed by his skin, and within hours, he began to hallucinate. Colors became intensely vivid. Familiar shapes seemed distorted. 
he had derived LSD from ergot, a discovery that would catapult him to medical fame and give him a godlike status in the eyes of the hippies. Linda now had the possible connection she was looking for, a natural fungus capable of producing LSD-like hallucinations. She consulted a medical friend to see whether the symptoms of ergot poisoning matched the records from Salem. I said to my friend, do you have anything that is like a, a pharmacological encyclopedia? He was a pre-med student, so this wasn't such a bizarre question to ask him. And um, it was almost as if the description in the pharmacological reference had been taken from the trial records themselves. It was just, it was just extraordinary. And, um, and that, for me, was a real eureka moment. To check out her theory, she decided to put it to the original LSD expert, Albert Hoffman himself. I wrote him a letter suggesting to him what my hypothesis was, and he wrote me back and he said, well, it sounds plausible. It wasn't a long letter, but certainly um, he answered the question that I needed him to answer. Her hunch was a good one. But there was a problem. If ergot was behind the hallucinations, how had the residents of Salem come into contact with the fungus in the first place? One pivotal piece of evidence pointed her in the right direction. She discovered that both people and animals had been affected. My husband, Benjamin Abbott, had not only been afflicted in his body as he testifies, but also that strange and unusual things has happened to his cattle, for some have died suddenly and strangely, which we could not tell any natural reason for. Men were sick, babies were dying, animals in the community were acting strangely, and people were concerned about the odd behaviors there. So it begins to look like something that could be in the food source, but it's got to be something that both people and animals would be consuming which would suggest going towards grain. Grain was the primary food source in Salem, and it was harvested from rye, their dominant cereal crop. It fed both the human residents and the farm animals. But was there a relationship between the ergot and the rye? Professor Maurice Moss has made a lifelong study of poisonous fungi. Here's an ergot, and uh, that little black thing there, do you see? Sticking out there. Rye and, and barley are the two main food crops, but there are about 17 other genera of grasses that are infected by ergot. When the fungus germinates in its host, it will use the plant's own nutrients as, it, as its nutrients, and will gradually replace the material of the developing grass seed with its own material. And you can see it, it looks rather like a seed. It's replaced a seed. So if conditions were right, the ergot fungus could have infected the rye fields in Salem. That would mean the bread the settlers made from the grain would also have been contaminated. These structures are also packed with a group of compounds called alkaloids. These are acutely poisonous. They will kill if you consume enough of them, but they have all sorts of other effects as well. Some of the natural alkaloids undoubtedly have hallucinogenic properties. The ergot alkaloids are nerve toxins, very complex, very diverse, but all of them have in common that they are nerve toxins. In the Salem trial records, Linda found reports not just of hallucinations, but also of other horrific symptoms. A pinpricking sensation, like insects crawling under the skin, and fits so powerful that the sick could barely be held down. We were conversant with Benjamin Holton for above a week before he died, and he was acted in a very strange manner with most violent fits. 
and he died a most violent death. And the doctor that was with him said he could not tell what his distemper was. The passage described a gruesome illness, but more importantly, it illustrated a precedent that had been set long before the settlers arrived in the New World. This was not the first time doctors had been stumped by an unknown illness. And this was not the first time they had made a diagnosis of witchcraft. One particular incident of supposed bewitchment took place in Europe more than 100 years before Salem. It happened in the English village of Warboys, near Cambridge. In 1589, a woman was accused of witchcraft at the manor house. So now we, we come in, mind your head, you'll find that the, the size of the doors are really quite low. They were obviously very much shorter people well, this in is, those This days. is magnificent, yes. Uh, and it's in here that we think possibly most of the action with regard to Mrs. Samuel uh, took place. Doctors and church leaders had been called in to diagnose a mystery illness that had struck down the five young daughters of the well-to-do Throckmorton family and seven of their servants. The symptoms were remarkably similar to those in Salem. There were a number of doctors who were extremely skeptical about witchcraft, but who were willing to come to the conclusion that a disease was caused by witchcraft or by demonic possession after all other available explanations had failed. It was one of the things that they had in their diagnostic armory. Folklore said that a witch could send out her familiars, animal spirits, to bewitch the weak and force them to make pacts with the devil. The sick girls showed all the classic symptoms of having been bewitched. They were plagued by hellish visions, often of wild animals, just as in Salem. One of them imagined she saw a cat tearing her skin from her flesh. The girls' bodies bent double in violent fits. They writhed on their beds in agony. They demonstrate symptoms which are typical of the ideas of bewitchment in the period. They're meant to develop abnormal strength, uh, and there are accounts of you know, strong grown men finding it very difficult to hold down a 10-year-old girl as she's going through her fits and her contortions. The diagnosis of witchcraft meant that some innocent person would have to take the blame. In War Boys, a local misfit named Alice Samuel was singled out as the witch. At the time, it was standard practice to torture accused witches. They were often branded, mutilated, or held underwater, struggling for breath. Anything to force the accused to confess and remove the bewitchment. Another thing which they believed at the period was if you scratched a witch uh, to draw blood, that would again alleviate the suffering of the person who was allegedly bewitched. And this does happen to her. This is a form of physical maltreatment that she is subjected to on several occasions. After a year of continuous pressure, Alice finally gave up and confessed to being a witch. But her confession brought no relief. As was the practice at the time, she was hanged by the neck and left to die a slow, tortured death on the gallows. Her husband and daughter were hanged as well for good measure. By 16th century standards, it was an open and shut case. Just as in Salem 100 years later, doctors and church leaders had blamed bewitchment for illnesses they could not explain. But if the modern, more scientific theory of ergot poisoning was to be confirmed, all the symptoms, not just hallucinations, would have to fit. Cutting edge research being done by pharmacologists in Holland shows how ergot could cause convulsions. The work centers on an ergot toxin called ergotamine which they are using in the treatment of migraines. Argot alkaloids have, uh, in general, a vasoconstrictor action. They constrict 
smooth muscles. Smooth muscles of not all, uh, all places, smooth muscles in the blood vessel. We found that uh, ergotamine has a very selective action on the blood vessels in this region. A simple experiment on live human tissue reveals how ergot may have produced the violent fits. Tiny six millimeter pieces of artery are mounted on two steel hooks and placed in a tissue bath. When a minute amount of ergotamine, the ergot toxin, is dropped into the tissue bath, its extraordinary constrictive power is revealed. Within seconds, the toxin causes the tissue to seize up, pulling the steel hooks together. What this experiment shows that ergotamine has that constrictive power on the blood vessels, will reduce the blood supply, will have a constrictor effect also in the chest region, and also reduce the blood supply to the brain, can lead to convulsions, hallucination, and symptoms of that kind. The needle charts the effect on the tissue as the toxin takes hold. A person suffering from ergot poisoning would convulse uncontrollably as the brain starves for oxygen. The draining of blood would cause a pricking sensation in the skin. Was this what was witnessed in Salem? They look like to me that there is a possibility or there is a strong possibility that, um, that they could have had ergot poisoning. In her quest to discover the driving force behind the senseless executions in Salem, Linda Caporell had found a prime suspect. Her challenge now was to conclusively place it at the scene of the crime. In time, the people in Salem began to haunt me, the people who were executed, and I would dream of them. And it would seem that uh, at times when I just thought, this, this story is too hard to put together, the research is too hard, I'd still feel compelled to move ahead. It was always for me um, not just a detective story, but it was a story about the people that had died there. To honor the people who had lost their lives, Linda had to prove her scientific explanation was correct. The symptoms were right, but could she determine that there had indeed been an outbreak of ergot poisoning that year? The fungus thrives in wet, damp soil. Her research showed that in 1691, the Salem farmers planted their rye crop in just such low, marshy ground. The colonists had favorite places for growing rye. They liked nice, uh, swampy meadows, which is not only good for growing rye and growing grain, but it's also good for promoting conditions that are conducive to ergot. The location was ideal, but the weather conditions also had to be optimal if ergot was to contaminate entire fields of rye. The initial infection of the cereal crop during the late spring, early summer, requires the dispersal of a particular kind of spore that is ejected into the atmosphere. And the fungus needs um, moisture in order to, to have the, 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 the pressure to be able to eject these spores into the air. So there is a stage in that early summer when um, a, 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 a wet, damp summer will ensure infection. A mass infection of Salem's rye harvest in the months prior to the witch trials would have required a warm, wet spring and summer. The chance discovery of a court magistrate's diary provided just the weather report Linda needed. I did not think that I would be able to find weather patterns. After all, it was a long time. And just by chance, I stumbled upon a, a copy reproduction of Samuel Sewell's diary. And he, he recorded the weather in there for uh, 1691 and 1692, which were the two critical years. 1691 was a warm, wet spring with a stormy, wet summer. And that is the year when this ergotized grain would have to have been growing. Linda also made another important discovery from the trial testimony. The vast majority of reports of sickness were confined to one side of Salem. In the village itself, amongst the western half of the village, people were reporting 
spontaneous abortion, hallucinations, choking, pinching, convulsions, uh, strange behavior. There was a very odd pattern. But it actually made perfect sense. She discovered that the western farms contained the swampy marshlands in which ergot was most likely to grow. And when she tracked down the addresses of the eight girls at the center of the witch trials, she found that six would have been eating rye from the same large farm west of town. I was surprised and pleased that it was possible to track down where people lived. Three of them were in the household of Thomas Putnam. He was the major landholder. Thomas Putnam's land was this perfect ergot growing ground. It was the swampy meadows that the Puritans valued as farmland. Uh, two girls lived in the household of Paris, and one girl lived in the household of Dr. Griggs. These two men were professional men, and they took a lot of their payment in terms of grain. The signs were all pointing towards ergot poisoning in Salem. But to strengthen Linda's theory, evidence of similar outbreaks in other places had to be uncovered. Rye had been a staple crop in Europe for centuries. If evidence of other infections could be found, it might help explain the waves of witch hunts that resulted in the execution of more than 40,000 innocent people in the Middle Ages. The records were promising. Outbreaks of an affliction that looked very much like ergot poisoning were periodically documented across Europe under several different names. St. Anthony's Fire, St. Vita's Dance, and the Evil Writhing. The illness tended to hit the poor, weaker peasant classes the hardest. It was their rye bread that was most likely to become contaminated by ergot. It doesn't take much imagination to think how a society which had not only no antibiotics, but really no medical knowledge or help available to the vast majority of its population would deal with an outbreak of contaminated food and just to see how quickly, rapidly and disastrously that could spread. With no pesticides to kill the fungus, the population was especially vulnerable to infestation. It struck hard at those with the poorest diets. If one's talking in the case of something like ergotism, which attacks people with low disease resistance, and particularly with low vitamin A, I would have thought the average medieval peasant was very susceptible to such attacks. If witchcraft was blamed for the symptoms in one location, it is hardly surprising that word would have traveled. A permanent association would be made, and any illnesses with even vaguely similar symptoms would from then on be similarly attributed to bewitchment. These cases become paradigms. People write about them at the time. The knowledge of them then travels around. It might well travel, you know, even across the Atlantic, perhaps, into the New World. It certainly travels through chapbooks, through ballads, and through learned treaties. So these things take on a tremendous importance. But was there a real connection between the outbreaks of ergotism and the rash of witch executions. Historian Mary Matosian found some startling correlations. I got into Europe uh, because I had to account for the fact that witchcraft persecution happens in certain years and not others, in certain places, not others. So I had to cover the map to make sure I wasn't missing something. Western Europe was ravaged by witch persecution especially during a 200-year period in the 16th and 17th centuries. But executions took place only in very specific areas. Matosian discovered that these areas did in fact significantly overlap with the major rye-growing regions, and that the weather conditions during those periods were ideal for ergot growth. Of course, the only way to prove that ergot poisoning was being misinterpreted as witchcraft would be to conduct blood tests 
and tissue samples on the body of a supposedly bewitched person, but there are no available remains from Salem or Warboys. But there is one body that can be tested, a body 2,000 years old. Grabala man is one of the infamous peat bog bodies. Men and women mysteriously buried in bogs during the Iron Age, when druids and mystics ruled harshly over superstitious peasants. He was discovered 50 years ago in his swampy tomb. It was a fine day in April in 1952, where the peat cutters, they went for work in a small bog 20 kilometers west of Moskow. And um, it wasn't long until they suddenly had to stop because they realized that there was something strange in the peat and uh, it looked like a human body. He was so well preserved. His hands, they were very fine. And his fingers, you could see the fingerprints, they were very delicate and very clear. The skin was as if it's, well, he was just from yesterday. But this man had not met a peaceful end. He had been brutally murdered. His skull had been cracked and his throat slit. The first thing we could see was that he had a cut ear to ear across the throat. It even went through the esophagus and uh, uh, left a big gap also between the third and the fourth vertebra. That, of course, must have killed him, but there were also other signs. He had uh, received a powerful blow to his right temple, and uh, which um, caused uh, the skull to crack. It was clear his attackers had gone to great lengths to ensure he was dead. Was it possible they had hunted him down and killed him because they thought he was bewitched or possessed by demons? A motive like that would explain the ferocity with which he had been slaughtered. If they feared him so much, they would have taken no chances. They cracked his skull, then followed up with a knife to the throat. A post-mortem conducted just after he was found in 1952 revealed a startling clue that meant nothing at the time. Today, it may explain the details of his death. A microscopic examination of his stomach contents revealed that his last meal had been contaminated by ergot. We were very lucky to have a rather big amount of stomach content from the Gauvelman. And it showed a huge composition of uh, cereals and weeds and small fragments of bone from pork. And uh, during the analysis, they found a huge amount of ergot these two jam jars contain what is left of his stomach contents. Ergot was clearly present, but the early test had not indicated whether the ergot alkaloids, the toxins produced by the fungus, had been absorbed by his body. Only that evidence would definitively prove that Grabalaman had been exhibiting the symptoms of ergot poisoning, the convulsions and hallucinations that might have led to his murder. We don't know whether they uh, had reached the gut wall, there to be absorbed into the bloodstream and transported to the brain and have their effects symptomatically. Uh, obviously, we couldn't determine that from looking at these things microscopically, uh, but this is where we need chemical analysis. The team was granted permission to perform the necessary tests on a tiny, precious piece of Grabala man's gut lining. Any traces of the ergot alkaloids would mean that the toxins had made it into his bloodstream and that he most likely would have been suffering from the effects of ergot poisoning. 
To his peers, he would have been exhibiting the same bizarre symptoms witnessed much later in Salem. The test, while simple, was a long shot. Could the traces of ergot alkaloids be found 2,000 years after the man had died? A process known as chromatography was used to split the various chemicals from the sample into a tiny ladder of colored bars. The results were then compared to a similar preparation from a modern sample of ergot. If the ergot alkaloids had been absorbed into the gut, they would show up as light blue markers on the paper. So here is the chromatogram from the gut extracts, and we have got at least one compound here giving a bluey color. And we know that there are some alkaloids from ergot that give this color with this oh, right. reagent. So that would fit basically with at least one component of ergot surviving these 2,000 years. Or possibly a, a, a compound related to what we find in ergot. Yes, that's true. And as extra evidence to that, when we've used another spray reagent on this, we do find that we have um, alkaloids in oh. this area. So right. certainly there are alkaloids so present. So there are definitely the alkaloids there. The presence of ergot alkaloids means the poisons had entered his bloodstream. The fact that this alkaloid was absorbed into the gut lining itself would suggest that he would have had that symptomology. Fitting, convulsing, and behaving in a way that may well have prompted his uh, uh, compatriots to assume possession, bewitchment, or something of that sort, and therefore to uh, uh, want him executed. Forensic science, 2,000 years after the fact, had provided a possible motive for the Grabalaman's brutal murder. It also offered chemical evidence to support Linda Caporell's theory that ergot poisoning had for centuries been misinterpreted as bewitchment. Linda was building a persuasive case. Her inspiration from LSD had been well supported by her findings from the Salem trial records. And now, the Grabalaman had provided chemical evidence of ergot poisoning. But what she still needed was unambiguous proof that ergot could ravage an entire community. Her big break was a modern one and came from an unlikely source a book stall at a local market. Just by chance, I found a book. It was about a case in France where the entire village had also been afflicted with ergot poisoning. Like a medieval plague, stalking through the towns and villages of Europe, a strange melody that sends people mad has hit Pont Saint-Esprit in France. The streets are as quiet as the death that threatens its inhabitants. And the cause, poisoned bread from this deserted baker's shop. It happened in August 1951, when an unsuspecting baker used a sack full of contaminated flour. 200 people were afflicted by a mysterious disease, Many required hospitalization, and in the weeks that followed, some got so bad, they were carted off to psychiatric asylums. My husband went to the bakery to get a little more bread because we didn't have enough. The first thing that happened, we started to be sick and to have stomach cramps. For everybody, it was the same thing. You couldn't catch a wink. You couldn't get to sleep. I was working at the mayor's office, and uh, in the morning when I arrived, no one, no one spoke of anything else. Then during the day, we heard about a man who had a rifle, and he wanted to shoot at anything that moved because he thought he was having hallucinations. Doctors and scientists were brought in from every major city in the area. Ambulances were commandeered, and the mayor's office became the emergency headquarters for the town. This original film footage from the outbreak shows the same violent convulsions that had been recorded in Salem. 
Victims describe the same pinpricking sensations, like thousands of insects crawling under the skin, and once again, terrifying hallucinations. In Pont Saint-Esprit, Linda had found the first-person accounts of the nightmare visions that for centuries had been interpreted as bewitchment. Oh, snakes! I'm frightened of snakes, especially snakes. I kept thinking that there was a snake in my bed. So I would say to my aunt, look, auntie, I think there is a snake in my bed. There were monkeys, bears, all sorts of things like that, and tigers, which would come into my bedroom. Not to be able to fall asleep is just horrible. The sick had to be strapped to their beds for their own protection. They were plagued by visions of fire, wild animals, and blood dripping from the ceilings. In order to escape from these animals, they would open up the windows and jump out. And there was a lady who was in hospital, and she was about 75 years old, and she opened her window, and suddenly she leapt out. But uh, she didn't die. You see, her nightdress got caught on a vine, a creeping vine. Uh, that's what saved her. But in the end, she did die from the bread poisoning. She was not the only one. The poisoning continued to take its toll as doctors and scientists searched for a cause. The town was rocked by the news that at least four others had died. I had some friends who would come to stay at our house. We'd eaten just a little, you know. Then they, they got sick too, because they'd eaten the same bread in my house, this cursed bread. They left here and later both of them died. They got sick and both of them died, the husband and the wife. As the number of dead increased, so did the sense of panic. People wanted answers. Chemical tests had been ordered in Marseille but rumors were spreading that the town's bread supply had been laced with arsenic or mercury. Finally, they got their answer. The sickness was caused by ergot poisoning. But the scientific result was not enough to silence all echoes of witchcraft. Even midway through the 20th century, some insisted on a supernatural explanation. They believed the bakery was possessed by the devil and called in a bishop to exercise the premises. Had the events in France occurred in the 1600s instead of the 1900s, I suspect uh, every house in the, in the village would have been exorcised. If religion provides an explanation of the idea that there's a devil, and that that devil is the thing that is the cause of um, these completely extraordinary events, then an exorcism seems to me like a perfectly reasonable thing to expect people to do. Just as in Salem, the fear and hysteria had led to actions that to us seem naive and foolish. And there was one more ironic connection between the French tragedy and the Salem trials. It was the tale of a dog that had eaten contaminated bread. The dog began running around ever-widening circles and began gnashing on rocks and broke off teeth as he was chewing on these rocks and his mouth was bleeding. Finally the dog died, blood caked around his mouth. It was just a ghastly account of a dog and that was, um, it was an incredible moment because suddenly it made sense of one of the events in Salem that had bothered me for a long time. The French dog had a parallel in Salem, a witch cake a piece of bread soaked in the urine of one of the sick girls had been fed to a dog to test if it too would become bewitched. Hours later, 
the first accusations of witchcraft were made. Until that point, the lid had been kept on witchcraft. People had been denying it, um, rejecting the idea that witchcraft could be the cause. But that experiment was the turning event. And if that dog in Salem behaved anything like that dog in France, it's very easy to see how suddenly people decide this is witchcraft, and that's the explanation. The test had been made, and the test had confirmed it. For centuries, people have turned to the supernatural to explain what frightens them most. When communities were struck down with a horrific illness that had no known cause, it was witchcraft that became the scapegoat. Now the real devil behind many cases of supposed bewitchment may finally have been found. The blame can be shifted from witches to ergot, the fungus from which the hallucinogenic drug LSD is derived. Its poisons are so powerful, they can induce the hideous symptoms that time and again have triggered brutal executions throughout the world. Gallows Hill in Salem is the spot where 19 innocent men and women were hanged for witchcraft. Their deaths now seem particularly senseless and tragic. When I reflect upon this event at Salem, one of the things I wonder about is, would things have been different had people known that there was such a thing as food poisoning? Had they known more? Had they understood better? Would all of this had simply not been part of history as we know it, but part of that daily, day-to-day -day life that doesn't become noted in history books? It's a desolate area in many ways, what must have been at that point in time. I can imagine children, even dogs. I can imagine babies crying so that there is this place where normal life meets up with life at its most abnormal and strange. And I can imagine people feeling self-righteous, people feeling that they have freed the community of danger. And in a sense, I'm, I'm glad to see that there's a baseball field and a playground within sight of here, a place where there's life in sight of this place of death. Reopen investigations of the past at PBS Online. History is revealing its forgotten secrets at pbs.org. ancient manual, obsessed with a deadly mission. <laughs> to prosecute, torture, and kill witches. And you can have this hammer. You can use it to smash them. For two centuries, the book helps ignite a reign of terror. Behind it, tales of madness, forgery, and scandal. What forces fueled its power? How and why did the book endure more than all others of its kind? 
As soon as you accept the notion that there is this vast, hidden, secret conspiracy of devil worshippers, a small town can be engulfed in, in a full-fledged witch panic. Now, an international team unlocks the bizarre secrets and fatal allure of the Witch Hunter's Bible. Maleficarum. Translation, the Hammer of Witches. 256 pages of dense Latin text, written in 1486. It is arguably the most comprehensive encyclopedia and legal manual ever created to prove that witches are real and must be put to death. It provides a authoritative text that, that other people can use to understand witchcraft, to make sense of this phenomenon. In the 16th and 17th centuries, with an estimated 30,000 plus copies in print, the hammer of witches spreads across Europe like a plague. In time, the book's ideas even reach the new world. By the end of the witch craze, the hammer helps send an estimated 60,000 victims to their deaths. But how did it become such an infamous and deadly witch hunter's Bible? The hammer didn't invent the witch hunt. Europe's first major witch hunts predate the book by more than a century. and other religious scholars had already written texts condemning witches. Yet to this day, over half a millennium later, no other medieval book on witchcraft is more notorious, read, or debated than the Malleus Maleficarum. What are the secrets to its enduring legacy? What drove its influence and allure? The witch hunting activities of the 1500s and early 1600s are driven by the intellectual ideas that are popularized by the Malleus. The Malleus Maleficarum went through many editions, was read by lots of people, and there are certainly a great many people who had known about witchcraft previously, may have had some doubts about it, and now they get persuaded. Now, a team of international experts, translators, and medieval scholars are investigating, examining original editions and detailed facsimiles on two continents, uncovering rare documents, and following the trail of evidence to answer the question, why was the hammer of witches so powerful? The evidence begins over 500 years ago with one of the most notorious witch hunters in history. A man some call deviant, even mad. 1485, Innsbruck, Austria. 48 women and two men stand accused of the practice of harmful magic, witchcraft, their alleged crimes, cursing adulterous lovers, using spells and elixirs to cause illness or death. One woman bears the brunt of the charges. In her trial, a visiting inquisitor takes command and ignites a scandal. He asks her about sex acts performed under diabolical influence. He insists sexual promiscuity is a portal to her witchly powers. A lawyer sent by the local bishop intervenes. He accuses the visiting inquisitor with unseemly and unlawful conduct. He demands all charges dismissed. The visiting inquisitor leaves Innsbruck, his trial a failure. He 
He is Heinrich Kramer, Latin name Instaturus, a famed inquisitor, and future author of The Hammer of Witches. Fourteen eighty six, fresh from his failed Innsbruck trials, Heinrich Kramer Instaturus begins his masterwork a book to prove that witches are driven by weakness and lust, vessels by which the devil is made flesh, witches who must be rooted out and burned. It will be Heinrich Kramer's ultimate vindication, a book of vengeance, forever silencing his critics and persuading the world, his witch hunter's Bible. When he wrote the Maleus Maleficarum, Krama must have been very, very angry and very, very frustrated. He had failed as a witch hunter. In a way, it is his last will, if you like, his testament. The Hammer's greatest achievement was to take one man's vengeance and make it a cause. One possible clue to its power, for centuries, Kramer's masterwork appeared to have the blessings of the church, yet looks can be deceiving. November 2009, Berlin, roughly 400 miles from where the Hammer of Witches was born, the German Historical Museum. Searching for evidence that might explain the book's unusual success, Malleus investigators Dr. Johannes Dillinger and Dr. Andre Schneider want to examine two copies up close. Available for viewing exclusively by appointment, this carefully preserved hammer of witches is more than 500 years old. Any quest to understand the book's success must begin with a critical document contained inside it. Some have seen it as the most powerful endorsement the hammer ever received from the church itself. It's called a papal bull. Similar to a royal proclamation, a papal bull is a document signed by the Pope stating an official church doctrine. It remains one of the most notorious bulls in history. The Sumus Desiderantus, known as the Witchcraft Bull. The bull states two important points. First, it warns against witches. This bull described what witchcraft actually is and what witches do. We make in some magical way hail and, and thunderstorms. Uh, we make people and livestock infertile, they kill and maim. And second, it gives official sanction by name to Heinrich Kramer to hunt them down. Today, it's hard to imagine the sway such a papal decree would hold, persuading readers that witches are real and that the hammer itself had the blessings of the highest religious leader of the day. But there's a problem. As the investigators zero in, the bull is more notable for what it doesn't say. At no point does it mention anything about the hammer of witches. The papal bull is dated three years before the hammer was published. So why is it included in nearly all editions? The answer begins in 1484. According to some historians, Heinrich Kramer prepares to travel to Rome. He is frustrated by authorities refusing to cooperate with his witch hunts. He brings a letter arguing for permission to prosecute witches under full sanction from the Pope. 
Kramer also brings an undisclosed sum, payment to help persuade the Vatican to agree to his request. Kramer's letter works. It becomes the foundation for the Sumis Desiderantes. The papal bull says nothing about the hammer at all. Yet Kramer knew exactly what would happen if he put it front and center. This bull came in very, very handily because it suggested that the Vatican was perfectly all right with everything the Maleus Maleficarum had to say. For the investigation team, the misleading bull reveals a striking possibility that the Malleus Maleficarum's success had nothing to do with certified papal approval, but everything to do with the master manipulator. Heinrich Kramer, a man obsessed with silencing his critics and changing forever the way the world saw witches, an evil that must be stopped. 1485 to 1486, the Tyrol region near Austria. Author Heinrich Kramer's Hammer of Witches begins to take shape. He is determined to create the definitive encyclopedia on the witch hunt. Kramer takes literally everything he can get his, hand, his hands on to prove that there are witches and witches are really, really dangerous. The hammer describes the dangers of witchcraft in detail. Clairvoyant sorcery, spells for deadly diseases, babies kidnapped and sacrificed, conjurations of natural disasters, blood drinking acts of cannibalism, witches flying through the air to meet demon consorts and attend ceremonies of black magic, sabbats. In his book, Kramer also incorporates real life examples of his own witch hunting. One sensational trial becomes his model. A trial that took place before his humiliation at Innsbruck. He sees it as a perfect, deadly witch prosecution. 1484, Ravensburg, Germany. A hailstorm has ravaged the region. The suspected cause? witchcraft. In court, eight women face a delegation of local officials and one other, Heinrich Kramer. Nearby is the Inquisitor's favored punishment, the strapado. Pulled upwards by their wrists, victims hang often until their arms dislocate from their sockets. At last, according to Kramer, two women confess to acts of demonic sorcery, causing deadly storms. Heinrich Kramer orders the women burned alive. For Kramer, Ravensburg is a great success. Two years later, in his masterwork, he depicts the trial as only he can, a detailed account from the executioner himself. In the town of Ravensburg, two women were burned to ashes. They endured many injuries at the hands of the devil. Yet to sell his book, Kramer fears his own credentials are not enough. To persuade his readers, he needs an illustrious co-author. What happens next is one of the biggest controversies surrounding the Hammer of Witches. Virtually all editions of the book credit two men, Kramer and a professor from the prestigious University of Cologne. Jakob Sprenger. Jakob Sprenger was one of the leaders of the Dominican monks in Germany. 
Some experts believe Sprenger did nothing more than write the Hammer's preface. Others, that the more distinguished scholar acted as a literary advisor. And still others believe Sprenger had nothing to do with the book at all, that Kramer simply forged the illustrious Sprenger's name. The reality was that Springer was much better known than Cromer, and that's exactly why Cromer put his name on it. One thing nearly all scholars agree on, Heinrich Kramer was almost certainly the dominant author. The hammer, inflamed with passion, filled with sensational language, is personal. 1486. By year's end, the hammer of witches is complete, a reference manual that goes further than any book before it, explaining the dangers of witchcraft. Witchcraft, one of the fundamental problems with it is it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, this whole notion that there's this diabolical conspiracy and that, that God allows Satan to give these women fantastic supernatural powers doesn't sound very plausible on its face. And what the Malleus does is explains exactly how this works, why God does this, and the evidence that exists to demonstrate that witches really do exist. To make its case, the book is organized in three parts. Part one, a philosophical argument proving the existence of witches. Part two, a guide for clergy, how to recognize witchcraft in your own community. And three, the most infamous of all, a legal manual, practical handbook for accusation, prosecution, and the witch death penalty. His book complete, Kramer could have no way of knowing how successful his three-part Witch Hunter's Bible would become. In time, it helped send witches to their deaths by the tens of thousands. Exterminating them through due justice, the passing of judgment. To understand the Witch Hunter's Bible's deadly impact, scholars examine the way the world saw witches, both before and after Heinrich Kramer Instatoris's Hammer of Witches. Isolated accounts of witch hunting date back to the Dark Ages. Europe's first widespread witch craze erupts in the mid-1300s, a century before the hammer. As witch hunting spreads, it also changes. What began as an effort to stamp out pagan sorcery, the conjuring of weather, healing and practical magic, transforms into a far more dangerous hatred. Witches morph from heathens into satanic heretics. By the time of the Malleus Maleficarum Hammer of Witches in 1486, there is still much debate over exactly how witches get their demonic powers. Up to the time of the, the Malleus, people disagreed very strongly, even people who believed in witches. The hammer provides the answers. The Malleus puts Institoris's stamp on, on the whole notion of witchcraft for the future. To the question, how does Satan corrupt humans, the hammer's answer is frightening. He makes them his accomplices, and lusty women are the most likely accomplices of all. Carnal lusting is insatiable in them, and for this reason they cavort with demons. Kramer is the one who provides the most systematic proof that these accomplices are almost always women. The title of the Malleus Maleficarum identifies witches as female. Kramer himself says that he refers to female witches rather than to generic or even male witches 
To the question, why are witches to be feared and exterminated? The answer is even more terrifying. Witches are a sign of the apocalypse. Before the day of judgment, they will all be equally cast down into hell. Institoris ties this harm, this devil worship, uh, to an apocalyptic fear of the end of days. God is so angered by the heresy of witchcraft that first of all, he's permitting Satan to you know, help witches do terrible things. But second of all, he's gonna eventually bring the world to an end. Not eventually, he's gonna do it sooner rather than later. The Tyrol region, December 1486. Offering new answers to age-old fears and superstitions, Heinrich Kramer's masterwork is almost ready to be published. Yet to help guarantee the book's success, one final document is missing, a critical review called an approbation. Like a modern-day celebrity endorsement, without an approbation, the work may be doomed to failure. It wasn't absolutely a given that everything that he claims in this text was going to conform with Catholic orthodoxy. I mean, his claim that you know, witchcraft is the greatest heresy, that seems kind of odd, actually. And so I think that he may well have legitimately been concerned that there was something kind of sketchy about some of his claims. And so he wanted the faculty to give its endorsement. Heinrich Kramer wants an approbation from one of the most prominent religious schools of his time, the University of Cologne. Conveniently, his credited co-author, Jakob Springer, is one of Cologne's most respected professors. Malleus scholars are divided on what happens next. Some say Sprenger and Kramer approach the school asking for a written endorsement. Sprenger's authority makes it an easy sell, and several scholars sign the approbation. Others say Kramer goes alone, impatient, demanding. He doesn't get what he wants. Incredibly, he falsifies signatures and later puts them in print. Yet would Kramer have dared such a blatant lie? Centuries later, two Malleus investigation teams work in tandem, examining the approbation up close. Berlin, only a few hours' drive from the University of Cologne, at the German Historical Museum, doctors Dillinger and Schneider look for signs of forgery. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., Malleus historians doctors Hans Brodel and Christopher Mackey plan to inspect the approbation in one of only several Hammer first editions in the United States. Kept at the Library of Congress under strict security, this copy was rebound centuries later, yet inside it is intact, dated 1487. The Hammer's approbation contains two parts. The first is a specific review of the book, signed by four Cologne scholars, witnessed by a notary. The second part is merely a vague approval of witch hunting in general, signed by eight scholars. And for these signatures, the notary was absent. The notary responsible uh, admits that he wasn't actually there to witness the signing of the second bunch of signatures, and that's a little strange. That's what a notary is supposed to do. And other evidence questions the signature's validity. At least two people who signed it later on claimed that they had not done so. And this would, of course, suggest that this is in part a forgery. Yet even if the signatures are real, they may not be what they seem. In fact, there's this one gentleman, Andreas, who even admits that, that he endorses the book only at first glance. Um, he, hasn't, he admits that he has not read the, the document carefully. And I think that's probably characteristic of 
quite a number of these guys. All told, the implication is alarming. The only religious scholar who specifies he did read the book carefully is a Cologne senior professor, and he finds it disturbing. He says, this is decidedly not a book many people should read. This is a book for experts. So he does consider this book, well, let's say problematic, maybe even dangerous. The approbation is included in virtually every copy of the Malleus Maleficarum. To all who read the book, there would have been no reason to doubt such a powerful endorsement. The approbation helped make the Hammer of Witches a phenomenon. By late spring 1487, with the approbation complete, the Malleus is ready for the public originally printed in the town of Speyer, Germany. The Witch Hunter's Bible is about to be unleashed. One of history's most infamous witchcraft books might have fallen into obscurity. But the Hammer of Witches coincided with an invention that changed the world. Cromer was influential in part, not only because he was systematic, but also in part because he knew how to exploit the technology of printing. After the introduction of the Gutenberg Press in 1454, authors could disseminate knowledge widely. For the first time in history, anyone with the means could write, print, sell, and distribute a book, influencing public opinion on a massive scale. With 150 copies released in its first print run, followed by hundreds more, promoted and sold to church and secular officials, local clergy, universities, and libraries, the hammer of witches spreads like a blaze. In time, some estimate it sells more than 30,000 copies. The hammer hits the public at the dawn of the 16th century, a volatile era of clashing nations and epic wars. A time when the Catholic Church faces some of its greatest internal strife and the Protestant Reformation is brewing. Into this chaos, the book's descriptions of apocalyptic witchcraft help create a culture of fear and suspicion. He was convinced, as were a large number of people at the time, that uh, witches were on the increase. Satan's influence was growing within Europe, and that unless one did something about it, then uh, Europe would be overwhelmed. Practices described in the Malleus become commonplace, posting notices on town doors, inciting villages to name names, invasive interrogations, how to use torture, and when to institute the death penalty. Yet from its first printing, not all approve of the Hammer's ideas. Over the next decades, a few critics raise strong objections. Almost immediately, there are folks ready to stand up and say, this doesn't make any sense. But it is not enough. Violent witch hunts continue across Northern Europe, wreaking havoc in Switzerland, France, Germany, and beyond. Read widely, the Malleus helped spark a new scourge of persecution, torture, and death. Fifteen sixty-three, Wiesensteig, Germany. Less than a century has passed since one of the Hammer of Witches' most notorious trials, the so-called demonic hailstorm of Ravensburg. The same accusation strikes again. This time, a prominent nobleman rounds up a group of women, accusing them of the identical crime, conjuring the devil to create a crop-destroying hailstorm. Incited by the noble landowner, the case bears two of the most critical elements necessary for any witch hunt. Panic.
panic and patronage. You always need a prince who is really willing to lend his power to witch hunters. You need a prince who is willing to accept witch trials in his courts. In addition, in close-knit communities, blaming neighbors for unexplained phenomena makes sinister sense. From time immemorial, people in small claustrophobic contexts like villages have had trouble with each other. One thing that this has led to in many societies is in fact this notion that certain people have the power to harm other people. In a festering witch hunt, hysteria feeds upon itself. The common people are eager to come forward and identify um, a known malefactor. She's a witch, she's a witch. People are buying into this notion of diabolic witchcraft. A small town can be engulfed in, in a full-fledged witch panic. Suspected witches are most often peasant women. Some practice herbal medicine, Others perform supernatural conjuring. Some are mentally ill. Many are simply beggars. Their only crime? Poverty. According to the hammer, the weak are the most dangerous. They're very deeply depressed, and along comes this extraordinary personage who turns out to be the devil, or a demon, um, and promises, if you do what I tell you to, I will restore your fortunes. At Wiesensteig, the women are tortured. Inquisitors who consult the Malleus Maleficarum's witch hunter's Bible know it is the surest way to get a witch to confess. If the person does not confess the truth, a second or third day of questioning under torture you can use torture to cause witches to name their accomplices. We know they have accomplices because they're part of this huge conspiracy. Among the worst devices, a head-boring iron helmet called the Skull Crusher, the Strapado, and a hand-smashing vice grip known as thumb screws. The Wiesensteig trials last for months. In total, more than 60 women confess and burn at the stake. And they are not alone. Soon, another trial is so notorious it rages for a staggering 30 years and claims more than 100 lives. A hammer against witches is about to strike again. From roughly 1550 to 1660, the ideas behind Heinrich Kramer Instatoris's Hammer of Witches helped spark an era known as the Burning Times. 1578, Rotenburg, Germany. Plagued with failing crops and bad weather, the town is seized with witch-hunting mania. But in Rotenburg, they have only one target, older women. It is an ancient superstition brought to hideous life by the hammer of witches. In the book, bitter, vengeful older women corrupt young souls and harm innocent children. The town of Rotenburg continues its persecution of elderly women, mothers and grandmothers for 31 years. By 1609, their tally burned at the stake at least 150 victims. Some believe the Malleus Maleficarum inspires some of the worst acts of hatred against women in history. But could such hatred or something else beneath it offer a clue to the book's powerful allure?
November 2009. Across the English Channel, Malleus investigator Peter Maxwell Stewart believes hatred is not the author's true motivation. He looks to something more significant. The Malleus's lurid sexuality. In The Hammer, women's sexuality runs rampant. Women do more than seduce and fornicate with demons. Throughout the book, female lust is a portal to Satan. Sorceresses lying on their backs, naked above the navel, their limbs in arrangement suitable for that filthy act. They're also much more emotional than men, which springs in part from their, um, from their sexuality. They can't control themselves, and a man is inadequate to the task. Then women are wide open to control by Satan. And that is partly, at any rate, why you find such a, an emphasis on sexuality in uh, the Malleus. The book's indictment of female sexuality helps justify new rounds of persecution. Institor specifically says in the Malleus that we're living in an age of women where women are running the show, where women's lusts and carnality are spreading horrible perversion everywhere. And I think that Institoris finds this domination of women to be a terrifying prospect and something that absolutely has to get stopped. But could the book's unusual sexual content help explain its lasting impact? To understand the Hammer's fixation on sexuality, Malleus investigators examine a unique paper trail. A series of letters chronicle the most notorious sex scandal associated with the Hammer of Witch's author. Letters written during Heinrich Kramer's failed Innsbruck trial. Everybody in Innsbruck, I think, would have been perfectly happy had he just proceeded against magic. And he starts talking about this, you know, conspiracy of diabolic witches, women who are riding around at night. Uh, he's particularly fixated on female sexuality. I mean, why on earth would you be asking her all these questions about sex? This is actually kind of weird and creepy. You must just say, this is typical of a witch's character. This is typical of a witch's behavior. To the extent that when we're trying a witch, we want to find out about that woman's background because if she has a history of sexual irregularity, that buttresses the accusation of witchcraft. The letters sent back and forth between the bishop, local authorities, and to Kramer himself, uncover a startling picture of Heinrich Kramer Institoris. Institoris's behavior was extremely disturbing. He was riding roughshod over procedure. He was browbeating the accused. After the trial, Institoris's behavior is even more disturbing. He lingers in Innsbruck, badgering accused women. The bishop sends further angry correspondence, demanding that Institoris leave. There's one famous letter in which the bishop yeah, warned Institoris that uh, there could be violent action, that the husbands of the accused could take violent action against him. The bishop who chased him out said he was actually a madman. This is the man responsible for the hammer of witches. Could such deviants have helped sell the Malleus Maleficarum's radical ideas? Some scholars note, like the racist lies in Hitler's Mein Kampf or other deadly propaganda, in many of history's most hateful texts, the more outrageous the prejudice, the more successful the persuasion. One thing is certain, by the dawn of the 17th century, the Hammer's legacy of persecution has spread further, as the witch hunt hysteria makes history in the English-speaking world. There, in some of the most fabled witch trials ever, the ideas behind the Malleus Maleficarum make one of their final indelible marks. 1692. The witch hunter's Bible's most dangerous idea helps turn a colony into a mob. Two communities make up the region of Salem, Massachusetts. 
rumors of violent acts of witchcraft against children begin to circulate, and accusations turn ugly. If your goats have been dying, your kids have, have, have gotten sick, if you can, can associate these harms with you know, threats from, from unpleasant people, you've got a case of witchcraft. Some prominent citizens dare the unspeakable. They express doubt. They question the validity of the charges and of the witch hunt itself. They too stand accused. Any who express doubt or defend their honor are suspect. Imagine living in a city today in which you knew that there were, you know, there was this secret diabolic conspiracy. Other people were blithely going around denying it, saying, oh no, this isn't true. Uh, this would seem worse than stupid. This would seem positively evil. Children bear witness. Family members die trying to protect their own kin. In time, even respected villagers hang from the gallows. In less than one year, town officials arrest 150 people, convict 29, and put 19 to death. Theories for the witch frenzy range from moldy, hallucinogenic grain to cultural repression even slave ghost stories. But no matter what the cause, any examination of Salem's horror leads to the single most damning legacy of the Malleus Maleficarum. A simple idea hammered home in the book that disbelief itself equals heresy. Put another way, questioning the very existence of witches makes the skeptic an accessory to the crime. Any text that begins with the bald statement that not to believe in witches is the worst of heresies, I mean, that's, a, that's an extremely provocative statement. In the psychology of witch hunts, such reasoning is the final nail in the coffin. And today, analyzing all witch hunt psychology, scholars agree. For 200 years, by turning doubt into a crime, the Malleus helped transform misogyny, paranoia, and fear into a monstrous institution. In the aftermath of Salem and trials like it in Europe, the witch craze is over. By the end of the 18th century, some estimate the final tally of witch dead at 40 to 60,000 victims. In the dark history of witchcraft, one unforgettable figure blazes through. Heinrich Kramer Institoris. Haunted by scandal, he devoted himself to a book of vengeance. A witch hunter's Bible obsessed with a single biblical warning. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. 